declare for me and let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be a sin a double cure save from wrath and make me pure and all the labels of my hand can fulfill the law's command could my zeal no respite no could my tears forever flow All for sin could not atone Thou must save and thou alone Nothing in my hand I bring Simply to Y'all can find a seat, and kids, you can go to Kids Church. Yeah, you're going get to get to go to Kids Church. So this church started, what, November, October, somewhere in there? And for several of the first months, we really focused on the basics of what it means to be a Christian partly for our own benefit, to make sure that it's solidified in our minds, but also to kind of establish what this church believes and what this church is about. And I feel that we've covered that and we've moved into um, more recently, what does it mean to walk the Christian life? What are some of the things that um, day to day it means to be a Christian? Today, I want to start what will probably be the beginning of a few on church life, what it means to be a part of a church and what some of the things that churches do mean and start a discussion on the things that churches do. Are they valuable? Are they commanded by God? Should we still do them or are we just doing them because they're tradition? So today I want to talk about baptism and sort of walk through that. So what is baptism? The definition that I would give is that baptism is symbolic of union with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. I've got a lot of scripture, so I won't apologize, but I don't want to say what I think. I want to present what the Bible says, and then we can take from that what we will. So starting in Romans 6, verses 1 to 4, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. 
This scripture spells out what I just said, the definition very clearly. It's symbolic of union with Christ in his death and resurrection. Obviously, we're not actually buried, but that's what going under amounts to symbolically and coming back up amounts to being joined in his resurrection. Jesus bore our sins on the cross and he rose again victorious over death, over sins. And it was once and for all. He did it. We don't have to do that. But when we're baptized, we're publicly representing that we understand what he did and we believe that his death and resurrection has the power to put sin to death in our lives and raise our lives again, not in the flesh, the way that we went down, but in the spirit of God and what the spirit desires for us. And we've talked, um, if you, if that's not ringing a bell or if that sounds like Christian speak, I encourage you to go back and listen to some of the sermons that are posted about walking in the spirit, being transformed by the spirit. Those are things that we've talked about. Second thing, what is baptism? It's a symbolic expression of the heart's appeal to God. First Peter three, 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Sound familiar? Put your flesh to death, live in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So the physical act of being baptized is your entire body saying, God, I trust you to save me. I believe that you are the only way and I can't save myself. I believe that my current sinful state separates me from you. And as my heart finds faith and my mind gets wrapped around it, I'll take the plunge to symbolize and memorialize the washing away of sins that your resurrection has provided. The imagery of the ark is, and the flood is pretty powerful. When I read it the first time, I read in my mind, the ark saved you. But it doesn't say that. It says those in the ark were saved by water. But they were in the ark. If they'd have been in the water, they would have died, right? The imagery, though, is... The flood, the water wasn't the danger. The wickedness and the sin on earth was the danger. They were spared death by the ark, but the ark or the, the flood, the water did the cleansing. The water wiped out through destruction all the sinful people and all the wickedness that was on earth. It's a much more powerful picture than the ark saves you. It's not a sponge bath. It's destruction of wickedness, destruction of sin. By by immersing ourselves in water, then we are joining ourselves to the death and the resurrection of Christ and the cleansing of sin that that represents. So I thought that was really interesting. It's a scripture that I've read before, but I just never really saw that part of it. And to me, it was really interesting. The author, after he says, he says, um, in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. If you stopped there, you could think that the act of baptism somehow had power. But he doesn't even stop his sentence. There's a hyphen there. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. So not the physical act, but what it represents, what's behind it, the motive behind it, the pledge of a clear conscience. God, I want you to wash my sin away. I know I can't do it. I'm going to be baptized to symbolize that I have faith in you. And that commitment is what will clear my conscience. That brings me to my final point about what baptism is, or in this case, isn't. Baptism in itself does not bring salvation. Faith in God does. Romans 10, 9 to 13 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. With your heart you believe and are justified. With your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. So baptism isn't the saving. It's the belief and the faith that's the saving. Baptism is the outward expression of that faith. It's symbolizing, memorializing that occasion. So why do we do it? The strongest reason is that Jesus commanded it. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, it says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is Jesus talking. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. There's a lot in this little passage. So first, Jesus made it clear that he had all power, all authority on heaven and on earth. Second, he makes it clear that his salvation is for everyone, for the Jew, for the Gentile, everybody. He doesn't discriminate. He doesn't play favorites. Then he says to his disciples, I want you to teach all nations. So I'm for everybody and I want you to be for everybody. Teach all nations to obey everything I commanded. He says, teach them to obey everything I commanded right after he commands them to baptize people. That's pretty strong. That's pretty airtight. Like, just that is enough for me. Baptize everyone, teach them to obey everything I command. Pretty straightforward. He then says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I think this just further solidifies that it wasn't just for the disciples. It wasn't just for a certain group of people. He was intentionally all-inclusive, and he intentionally said, I'll be with you till the end of the age. He's still here with us. This still is valid. This is still something he wants us to practice. Beyond that, it is the decisive way to take a Christian stand. Acts 2, 32 and 33 says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Skipping down to verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So here are people new to the gospel, hadn't heard, didn't understand. And Peter is teaching and he says, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He, he's giving them the gospel. And when they hear it, it says they were cut to the heart. It went right to the middle of them and they knew they needed to do something about it. What do we do? We need to act on this. We, we believe you. What do we do about it? And immediately he says, repent and be baptized. And then he follows it up with the promises for you and your children and for all who are far, far off. He's echoing exactly what Jesus told him to do just a little bit before. So we see Jesus commanded it. We see Peter and the early church picked it right up. And we also see that for those who heard the gospel fresh, that they felt compelled to do something about it. And this was the thing. They just said, what do we do? This was it. Repent and be baptized. It then says those who accepted were baptized. It doesn't say that some of them thought it might be neat to do. Like, maybe we'll do that. That sounds like fun or that sounds, you know, like something that might be special. It says they were. And for me, that says that for the early church, this was integral with the acceptance of Jesus' message. And this was the proclamation of faith. 
This was how they signified, I have faith. The universality in the early church is actually hidden in a verse we already read. Um, Romans 6, 3, we read 2 to 4. In Romans 6, 3, Paul says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So if we go back to that scripture, he's answering a church that he's never been to. He's never been to Rome. He's never been to this church doesn't know these people, and he's answering them, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. So the idea had percolated in the Romans church, evidently, that grace covered all sin, so we didn't need to worry about sin. We'll just keep sinning. And to answer this, he went to something different but something that he thought would be so clear to them and so obvious to them that it would make sense and it would clear up any doubt. What did he go to? He went to baptism. He had never been there, but he says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? He is assuming they all have all been baptized if they're members of the church. This was something that everybody did in the early church. So going back to the Bible in the early church as a model of Worship, fellowship, and relationships is a goal of this church. It's something that, um, you know, when Justin and Jeremy and Titus and I, and, you know, most of you have been here from the very start when we started talking about, you know, what, what should a church look like? The obvious place to start was what did the first churches look like? What were they all about? Um, lots of churches do a lot of things right. We're just saying, Let's take a fresh look at it. What does the Bible say? And I think baptism here is very, very clearly part of the early church and a very important part. Going back to the early church as a model is why we have lunch here after every service. We read Acts up to verse 41, 2 up to 41. In verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That's I guess if the church had, if this church had one verse, that's it. Um, okay, it says what they, this is a verse about what the early church did, so let's do that. Let's devote ourselves to teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. And right before that, they were talking about baptism. So we've already established that faith, not baptism, is what saves us. So I'm not suggesting that you have to be baptized to be saved. But I think it's important to note that the only scriptural account of a New Testament believer who wasn't baptized is the thief on the cross. If I'm wrong on that, like, point it out. But I couldn't find anything else, and I found another pastor who said that's the only scriptural account. Um, so in, in Luke 23, 42, the thief is hanging on the cross, and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He, he's on the cross next to Jesus. He is in a bind. He needs to make something happen in a hurry. I think Jesus understood the situation they were in and says, truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise. None of us today are nailed to a cross. None of us are in that dire of a situation. It's not to say that we won't find ourselves in a dire situation. We could pull out of here and be in a dire situation. But right now we're not. So right now is the time to deal with these things. And we have opportunity for things like this. We have opportunity to be baptized. We have opportunity to express our faith to God, to tell him we believe. And the evidence of our belief is that we will be baptized and memorialize that. So this is one of the most universally accepted symbols of the early church. It was commanded by Jesus. Peter basically took Jesus verbatim and followed it up. And by the time Paul gets into the mix, it was a foregone conclusion that church members, that Christians would be baptized. So who should be baptized? We believe believers should be baptized because baptism is an evidence of faith so you must have faith to, to be baptized, and it means something. Colossians 2, 8 to 15 says, 
See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. I'm going to stop right there because that is why we in this church, this group of people, are analyzing everything. We want to make sure that we're not being taken captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy that depends on human tradition. We want to get back to the heart of it. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross." I love that imagery. I love the imagery of Jesus taking back the power. We've talked so many times about the way um, the Pharisees or our current politicians or even some of our current religious leaders or structures use religion, use God as a way to control. And it makes it very, very clear. He made a public spectacle of them, tri triumphing over them by the cross. Now, the, the scripture here, it compares baptism to circumcision. If you don't know what that is, Google it on your own time. Don't ask somebody. You'll be embarrassed. Um, so <laughs> I remember when we were in Sunday school as kids, and we had just got our Bibles, and we could read. And I remember Jensen Long asking my mom in front of everybody, what is this word? I was reading the Bible. What is this word? And uh, maybe it was my dad. And he said, hey, does your Bible have a concordance? And he flipped to the back. And you could see when he found that he just went. <laughs> anyway, side note. So the, the scripture we just read compares baptism to circumcision. Circumcision was symbolic of the dying of the flesh and living in the spirit. It was also how you could tell a dead Jewish male from a dead Gentile male. It permanently, it permanently marked the recipient as belonging to God. He was one of God's if he was circumcised. So the fact that baptism replaces circumcision in this uh, passage here in Colossians is probably where the idea of infant baptism came from that a lot of churches practice because circumcision was done on the seventh day, I believe, and so it would stand to reason then for some people, if they were just sort of reading one passage or trying to replace what they know with something else directly, that we'll just baptize our babies then because it's just like circumcision. And then by us doing it for them, somehow it'll just take. But the scripture that we read, the evidence that we have in scripture is that it's something that has to come by faith. Like, I understand the enthusiasm. I can understand the parents. I can understand the early church thinking that this would be a good idea. But I think they got off the mark on that. The scripture we studied says that faith precedes baptism and baptism is the public declaration of faith. So an infant is too young to understand faith and the commitment of their life to God through baptism. So by extension, we believe that infants are too young to be baptized. It's something that they need to do when they come to their own faith, when they come to their own understanding, and when they make a decision, I will follow. I believe and I will follow. So if anybody here has questions about baptism or you would like to talk about it, if you'd like to get baptized, talk to Justin, talk to Jeremy, talk to me, talk to Titus. If you haven't been baptized as a believer, you should. Tell one of us you'd like to get that taken care of and we'll make sure it happens. There's a story in Acts 8 where Philip is walking on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. And along the way, he meets an Ethiopian eunuch who's riding in a chariot. And he, he can see that he's reading. And the spirit of God pricked Philip and said, go stand by that chariot. And when he got by the chariot, the eunuch says, um, or Philip asked the eunuch if he understands what he's reading. And he says, no, how can I unless someone explains it to me? 
This picks up in Acts. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. He presented the gospel. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. There's nothing that you have to qualify for to be baptized. The same as there's nothing you have to qualify for to have faith. In fact, if you think you can qualify to have faith or to be baptized, you're missing the point entirely. Faith is recognizing that I'm not good enough and there's nothing that I can ever do that will be good enough. My faith is Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose again and he can clean me up and he can make me righteous and holy though I don't deserve it. That's the faith, understanding that you can't. So we've talked about what baptism, baptism is, why we do it, who it's for, and now sort of the rubber meets the road. Titus talked last week from James, I think he used this passage, or this verse 122, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. We can see evidence in Peter, you know, when Peter was talking to the, the crowds in Acts, 3,000 people believed and were baptized. When, you know, so that's a Billy Graham rally, right? Like that's a big to do. Philip is walking down the road and sees one and one believes and was baptized. From one to 3,000 and everywhere in between, it's for everyone, it's for all of us right now. Titus used that passage last week and, and talked about in James how it says we need to put our faith into action. If we don't put our faith into practice, it's, it says in James that it dies. So putting our body in motion, doing something to signify our faith will strengthen our faith. So for me, though, baptism is a lot like a wedding. For some people, weddings might be like just the greatest thing ever. Gabby was over on Friday and we were talking about this. I hate weddings. Like I, I made it to my own. But for me, they're awkward and uncomfortable and, you know, not so great. But, you know, I got married and... It is a milestone that I can look back on. It's a point in my life where I can say, I know where I stood, I know what I promised, and I know who stood with me. And everyone around that was a witness that day also knows where I stood that day and what I vowed, what I promised I would do for the rest of my life. It's like that with baptism. When you get baptized, life then will continue to happen and things will get tough and things will be good and things will get tough and things will be good. But there's that moment where you know, I joined myself to Christ, never to be separated. I made a vow and the witnesses that were there with me, even if it's only one, also saw it. It did happen. It really happened. When we get married, we put a, a ring on our spouse's finger and we say, with this ring, I thee wed. This doesn't have any power. This is my fourth one. I, like they, they fall off, I, they get lost. It doesn't matter. The ring doesn't have the power. The vow does. The vow behind this ring is what matters. It's the commitment that I made by putting that ring on her finger. As my life goes on, everyone that sees my left hand knows what I did and they know that this one is spoken for. I'm spoken for. I'm attached. Baptism is that. It's saying, God, with this baptism, I thee wed. I'm joining you publicly in this moment, and this symbol will tell the world and heaven and hell, this one is spoken for. This one is God's. So I don't know. Everybody in here may be baptized. Um, and that's great. If you're baptized, that's great. If you're not, I would encourage you to. Um, what I'd like to do now is Jeremy's going to just sing one for us. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time in silent prayer, just thinking about if you were baptized, think about the time 
when you were baptized. Think about making that vow. Think about what your emotions were like inside when you understood I'm joining myself to Christ in this moment. Yes, I believe. Yes, I committed in my mind. But this thing right now that I'm doing is going to memorialize that and symbolize that for the world to see and for myself to remember. If you haven't been baptized, I'd encourage you just to pray about getting baptized. Seek God on it. Ask him, God, do you want me baptized? I think his word says yes. And more than that, if you've been baptized and you get through that and you know people that aren't, and you know people that don't believe, just take a minute and pray for them. Pray that they'll come to that understanding where they're ready to turn their life over to God and join themselves together with him. So let's just pray. and depth of your word. Something as simple as baptism has so many layers. Thank you for the beauty and the poetry that you use through your symbolism and through the things that you've commanded us to do. The symbolism of baptism is beautiful and wonderful and terrifying and humbling and exalting. It's death and life and everything wrapped into one expression of faith. Help us this morning to understand why you wanted us to be baptized. Convict and correct us if we've been wrong about it. And spur us on if we've yet to be baptized. And finally, keep your hand on us as we continue to dive in into what it means to be your church. I ask that you bless this food and those that provided it. Bless our time around the table together. Keep us safe. We love you. Amen.